Today we're going to continue our discussion of evolution and we're going to discuss how it changes the genetics of a population. So if you think about an insect population and you apply a pesticide, such as here, we apply a pesticide to this first generation of insects, there are a few that are resistant to that pesticide, so a few are going to survive. And then those insects pass their resistance on to their offspring. And so then we have a later generation. Notice the different color combinations there. And then in the later generation, the notice the red ones are surviving more because they have the pesticide in resistance. So remember we talked about um, both single gene and polygenic traits. A single gene trait would be like tall and short in pea plants or whether you can roll your tongue or not. Um, polygenic traits remember would be things like skin color, eye color, height, those types of things. Um, so natural selection on a single gene trait leads to changes in the frequency of the alleles and that leads to changes then in our phenotype frequency. Phenotype, remember, is the outer appearance. Uh, natural selection on polygenic traits affects the distribution of the phenotype, the outward appearance, in three ways. What's called directional, stabilizing, and disruptive selection. We'll be talking more about all three of those here in this section. Evolutionary succession is the success in passing your genes to the next generation. Um, the adaptation, an adaptation remember is any genetically controlled trait that increases your ability to pass along to its alleles. So we have Joe has a mate and he has children and then those children have children. Compared to Jim, who Jim does not mate and Jim does not have children, so we would say in terms of evolutionary fitness, Joe has higher fitness than Jim because Joe passes his genetics on to the next generation. Single gene traits um, lead to changes in allele frequency and then evolution. So single gene traits, uh, lip protrusion we talked about, ear lobe attachment, those are all single gene traits. An example in a mutation in a gene for lizard body color could affect that can affect their lifespan. So if the normal color for lizards is brown, the mutation could produce red and black forms. So the mutation changes the color. So to begin here, we see our initial population. We have 80% brown lizards. 10% red lizards, and 10% black lizards. Let's investigate why the red lizard population went down to zero, the black lizards are increasing, and the brown lizards then are decreasing. So red lizards are more visit visible to predators. A single gene trait, such as li lizard color, uh, red lizards are more visible to predators, so they're less likely to survive and reproduce. So the allele for red coloring might not become common and would then die out. Black lizards might have an, and might be an, adapt an adaptation that would allow them to absorb more sunlight and increase their, because they're cold blooded, they would have a higher body temperature, absorbing more sunlight, they can move faster, escape predators, reproduce more often, pass those alleles on to their offspring. So as a result, the allele for black color becomes more common. So we see that the as we go 10 generations, 20, 30 generations, we see the black lizard population growing. When we have polygenic traits, the range of phenotypes often forms what's called a bell-shaped curve. So this would be a bell-shaped curve. 
So we would start with the fur color of, of mice. Light color, there are very few that are light colored. There are very few that are dark colored. Most of them are kind of in the middle. So we get this lots in the middle and fewer on the edges. The fitness of individuals can vary from one end of the curve to the other. And natural selection can affect the phenotypes of this and the shape of this curve. We get what's called first directional selection is the first way that uh, polygenic traits are affected. And that is when individuals at one end of the curve have higher fitness, fitness than individuals in the middle or at the end. This shifts our phenotypes to one end or the other. So, for example, beak size is a polygenic trait. We have a few uh, that have a small beak, a lots that have a medium-sized beak, and a few that have a large beak. So, for example, in, in our population here, only large seeds are available. So, uh, the population only has large seeds. Birds with larger beaks have an easier time feeding. They're more successful in surviving and passing on those genes. So over time, we see the solid line moving over, we get more have a larger beak and fewer have smaller beaks. In stabilizing sele selection, individuals near the center of the curve have higher fitness. Um, it keeps the center of the curve at its current position, but it narrows the graph. So we begin, say, with uh, size of babies. So initially we have uh, a few very small babies, av many average size babies, and a few very large babies. But very small and very large babies are less likely to survive than average size individuals. So the fitness of smaller and larger babies is lower than that of average size individuals. So over time we get a fewer very small babies and fewer very large babies and more average size babies. Disruptive size, disruptive selection is when the upper and lower ends of the curve have higher fitness than individuals in the middle. So it acts against the intermediate and can often wind up with two distinct phenotypes. So, for example, here we have beak size again. A few have a small beak, lots have a medium-sized beak, and a few have a large beak. If you're in an area where medium-sized seeds are less common, we have lots of small seeds and lots of large seeds, that means unusually small or unusually large beaks have higher fitness. So the population might wind up, so then we have a lot of beak and over generations, we'll get more birds with large, smaller beaks and more birds with larger beaks and fewer birds with medium-sized beaks. So the population might split into, split into two groups, one that has small beaks and one that has larger beaks. Another term we're going to talk about here is called genetic drift. Um, in a small population, Individuals that have a specific allele can leave more des descendants than others just by chance. We know it is chance which individual which um, uh, chromosomes get passed on during meiosis, and so a series of chance occurrences could cause an allele to become more or less common in a population. Another hap thing happens in genetic drift is an allele becomes more or less common simply by chance. So here we have a popul small population of bugs and a couple of the bugs get squashed. So now our genetic, our allele frequency or our phenotypes have changed because I have now I have fewer green and more, a higher percentage of brown. The bottleneck effect is when we have a change in the allele frequency or the, pop, the genetics of the population following a dramatic reduction in the size of the population, following some sort of natural disaster, many individuals in a population are killed off, 
The population's gene pool may contain different gene frequencies from the original gene pool. So here we have a, a population approximately equal, um, blue and yellow. When we have a genetic uh, disaster of some sort, we call the bottleneck a bottleneck, so a drastic reduction in population. The surviving individuals, notice we have more blue than yellow, and that's simply a matter of chance. And then our next generations, then more blue than yellow. So we have a different um, allele frequency or a different percentage of each allele. The founder effect um, occurs when our uh, percentages change as a result of a migration of a small subgroup of a population. So if we have a large, uh, here we have a large diverse population of ladybugs. Um, and then we a small group of them leave and form a new population in a different area and another group leave and form a new population in a, in a third area, then the descendants are going to look much different than, if, than the original population, and that's called the founder effect. The last thing we're gonna talk about here is called the Hardy-Weinberg principle. The Hardy-Weinberg principle describes conditions where evolution does not occur. So Hardy-Weinberg principle says that allele frequencies or percentages in a population remain constant unless one or more factors cause those frequencies to change. So if the allele frequencies in a population remain constant, then we get no evolution. Here are the five principles that, or five conditions that are according to the Hardy-Weinberg principle must be met. Number one, the population must be very large. Number two, there can be no mutations. Number three, there must be random mating. Number four, there can be no movement into or out of the population. And there can, number five, there can be no natural selection. So the Hardy-Weinberg principle says you must have all five of these things in order for no evolution to occur. And we know life doesn't really happen this way. We know there are mutations frequently. Uh, there's not always random mating. Think about birds and peacocks, for example. The um, most beautiful colored males are the ones that get to mate the most often. Um, and we know natural selection does occur. So the population is in genetic in a genetic equilibrium if frequencies of the alleles remain the same. If the frequencies of the alleles don't change, then the population will not evolve. We know this is not true. It doesn't happen very often um, that we, we achieve genetic equilibrium, so evolution happens more often than not.